Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm happy to have you here with me today. Today we're gonna to get up to a whole bunch of stuff as we usually do, but first up, we are going to make the world's best pancakes. At least that's what my mom calls them. And they are in our cookbook, which uh, the digital version is still available over on our website. We are working on a second edition of our cookbook with a whole bunch of new recipes that's going to be coming out in September is the goal that we're aiming for. Creating a cookbook is a very time consuming, um, endeavor, but it's super fun because it is really creative. So we're having a lot of fun doing it, but it is a little bit time consuming. So September is when you can keep your eye out for that. In the meantime, the digital version of our first edition is still available. I'm going to be making these pancakes differently than you traditionally would. And I have shown this on my channel before, but I think it's been a year or two since I have. So I thought it was time for a refresh on it. And that is making them on a sheet pan. So I have a couple of reasons for doing this. Number one is it saves a ton of time. You don't have to stand over the stove flipping pancakes. The other thing is you can make a whole bunch of pancakes all at once and everyone can sit down and eat at the same time with nice hot pancakes. And I do find that when I'm making them on the stove top, I um, have to put them into the oven and then they're not kind of as fresh and fluffy as they are when they come right off of the griddle. Either that or everybody's kind of eating in cycles at the table. You know how it is. With the sheet pan pancakes, everyone can sit down at once to fresh made pancakes. The other thing that's awesome about them is that there's no smoke involved. So you know when you're frying anything on the stove. For us, we use cast iron fry pans on the stove with some oil or butter or something. And of course, there's always smoke involved and there is no smoke with this, which is fantastic. So let's get this recipe going, and I will give you the measurements for the single batch of these, but I am going to be tripling it today. So if you'd like to grab a pen and paper right now, I'll run you through the recipe, and you can jot it down. I'm going to be tripling this recipe today, so the measurements you're gonna see me do will be tripled to what I'm gonna give you right now. So you're gonna need two cups of all-purpose flour, a quarter cup of granulated sugar or some other sweetening substitute, four teaspoons of baking powder, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, a half a teaspoon of salt, one and three quarters cup of oat, almond milk, or cow's milk, I'll be using cow's milk today, a quarter cup of olive oil, two teaspoons of vanilla, a dash of nutmeg, and one large egg. So we're gonna start with mixing all of our dry ingredients in a bowl. So I'm adding six cups of all-purpose flour, three quarters cup of granulated sugar, 12 teaspoons of baking powder, three quarters teaspoon baking soda, one and a half teaspoons of salt. I'm going to add a little bit of cinnamon to this rather than nutmeg today and mix it up. And we have just under six cups of milk and three eggs, six teaspoons of vanilla. Add a whisk. So we're mixing our wet ingredients into our dry ingredients and mixing them just until they're mixed, but still a little lumpy. Then I oiled some parchment paper on a cookie sheet and spread everything out. These are going to go into the oven at 350 degrees Celsius for around 20 minutes or until slightly golden brown on top. All right, our pancakes are ready. Giant pancake. You can see how thick these pancakes works perfectly for filling teenager bellies. So I made some fresh whipping cream with a little bit of vanilla and topping it off with some peaches and some maple syrup. So we're just gonna eat some breakfast now and then you and I are gonna head outside, out down to the garden and the greenhouse because it does look like it might rain, which would be amazing, but at least we can still do gardening work in the greenhouse and be protected from the rain. Well, it is most definitely raining out here. So I guess to the greenhouse we go. Oh my goodness, we're gonna have to make a run for it, I think. I know Dan is out here somewhere. Maybe he's actually in the shop. He had some work to do on some of the machines so he could do more road building up that away. But I haven't heard him come past since he went up the mountain. Now we're getting a little bit of hail. Goodness, uh-oh. <laughs> Yikes. Oh, here we go. 
so cozy in here. Thankfully, as I was setting up my camera and kind of getting myself oriented in here, the rain stopped, which is a good thing because it was so loud that I couldn't even hear myself think. It is kind of cozy if I'm in here by myself with the rain, but trying to film, not so much. So what we're going to do today is plant a whole bunch of pickling cucumbers. It is pickling cucumber planting day and I have a ton of these that I save year to year that I use for planting my, uh, my pickling cucumbers. They don't grow nearly as fast as the larger squash do, which is why I don't put them in large containers like this. The reason that I do put them in larger containers like I just showed you for the squash is because they grow extremely quickly. And one of the things about squash is they don't like to be transplanted. They tend to go into transplant shock. And what transplant shock does is it actually stunts the growth of your plant which in a short growing season like ours can actually make or break whether we get a good harvest or not so I always try to do everything that I can <laughs> start bikes going past um, to do everything that I can to prevent the transplant shock from happening. So one of the bonuses of using these little paper pots that I make is that I can just peel these off very carefully and disrupt the roots hardly at all and put them straight into the hole out into the garden so I don't need to tip them upside down, squeeze them or do anything to disrupt them. And that tends to work really, really well. The reason that I start mine four weeks before and no sooner before my last frost date is because I don't want my vines to get too big because as you know, squash vines tend to be quite fragile and with that transplanting, you can end up breaking them off and it kind of defeats the purpose of all that extra growing time anyway. I find four weeks is ideal if you aren't able to plant right into the soil around this time of year, which we definitely aren't. And then also using these paper pots for the least amount of root disruption. Cucumbers are similar as far as the level of transplant shock they get into. So ideally, if I had little tiny paper pots that I could use for my cucumbers because they are similar as far as the transplant shock goes, I would do that. But since I don't, and I certainly don't want to be making that many little tiny paper pots, we are going to use these plastic ones and just be really gentle when we take them out. So first things first, let's get these all filled up with some soil. I'll also run you through some of the squash varieties that I am I'm growing this year. I'm growing, I don't know how many different varieties, but quite a few. And if you've been here for a while, you will know that I love growing squash so much. And I have a plan this year because the last two years we've been hit with a June frost around June 10th, both years actually. And I ended up, because I usually plant my squash out into the garden, in the first week of June, I have ended up having them get damaged by the frost, which has the same result as any type of shock to the plant, that it's gonna stunt its growth a little bit. So my squash harvests haven't been as great the last couple years as they had been in previous years. So this year, I am going to be using frost blankets. I bought a big frost blanket, and I'm going to use some frost blankets on my squash every night until we're well past June 10th. I am not taking any risks this year. So I like to do around 50 pickling cucumber plants. We'll start with these ones. Okay, let me show you what we're gonna plant. And I'm gonna plant a couple of other things besides just the pickling cucumbers, but we'll run through the pickling cucumbers first. Okay, we're gonna do homemade pickles. This is one of my favorite varieties of pickling cucumbers. We've got the National Pickling Cuke. This is another one that's pretty good. So this is from High Mowing Seeds and I haven't tried this one before. This is Market More 76 Cucumber and it says easy to grow high yielding slicer cucumber. So usually I grow my slicers in my high tunnel but I think I'll try a couple of these outside this year. And then I have, I don't even know where I got this, Pacific Northwest Seeds. Where did this come from? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, okay, this one can be grown in the ground or trailed up garden netting or trellising to save space. Small green fruits have mild flavor. Good for soaking up pickle spices. So another pickling cucumber. So we're gonna plant up those. And then I am going to be doing some sunburst scallopini. We are going to do some Costa Romanesco um, zucchini and some Cocazelle zucchini. And I did both of these 
zucchinis last year and I absolutely love them. They were super prolific and just a really lovely zucchini. So we're gonna do that. And then one more, which is my standard Black Beauty. And this one I grow every single year. I'm also going to do some cucumelons for my daughter. She absolutely loves these. They are a little tiny cucumber that looks like a fairy watermelon, exactly like a little fairy watermelon. They're very, um, tart and crisp, a little bit sour, which surprises me that my daughter likes them, but I think she likes them more because they look like fairy um, watermelons. So we're gonna plant some of those. And then somewhere around here, I had some actual watermelons. Where did I put those seeds? Oh, I did some of these. Lisa sent these to me. These were farthest north melon, and I did plant a couple of these uh, yesterday. I think it was yesterday as far as melons go. I don't grow usually a ton of melons just because it's just not hot enough here and it doesn't stay warm enough at night. But I'm gonna try some cantaloupe this year in the high tunnel, of course. Some bush sugar baby. And I thought I had one other one. Oh, I did. This one was a, oh, this is a sugar baby too. I think I'm gonna do the bush sugar baby because it's a bush instead of a vining one. So we'll also plant a couple of those. And I have a container here I've been cutting off of to make um, tags because it's free, super, super easy, and they last forever. So cut up a few more of these. I know lots of people use old Venetian blinds. My preference is to use these because this is a food grade plastic. So I'm not sure kind of what chemicals or whatever in the, those old Venetian blinds. So my preference is to use old yogurt containers, or in this case, this is a mayonnaise um, container. So there we go. Now I have some tags to mark with. So we'll start by moving these seeds back so they don't get wet. And we're gonna give this a water to fill my water bucket again. I wanted to share with you something that a, several people have commented to me lately is that they have been unsubscribed to my channel by YouTube. And this is a fairly common phenomenon with uh, YouTube. I'm not really sure why it happens, but if you could do me a favor and please double check that you are actually subscribed to my channel and also that you have the bell notification turned on so you can be notified when I post videos. We are working out a way to be able to do live videos from the greenhouse, which I think would be a lot of fun over the summer months. And in order to get notified when I go live or when I'm going to go live, you do need to have that bell notification turned on. So if you could do that, that would be fantastic. Okay, next, let's start with just filling these up with a bunch of pickling cucumbers. So we'll start with my homemade pickles. So the germ germination rate on these guys is around 80%. So I'm actually just gonna put one seed per cell with these because I apparently don't have that many of my favorite seeds. I don't know why I ordered such a small package of them. That's weird, but at least I have lots of other um, pickling cucumber seeds. So these don't need to be buried very deeply at all. They're a fairly small seed. The rule of thumb that I use is I bury my seeds the depth of the seed itself. So I put it in the ground, the depth that the seed actually is, and that seems to work pretty well for just about any seed. That way, if your seed is only a millimeter across, then you're only going to barely put it in the soil. If it's a centimeter, you're gonna go down a centimeter and so on. So I'm just barely pushing these in, and then I'm just gonna cover them up with a little bit of soil and give them another good soak. So if I notice, because the germination is only 80% on these, if I notice that some of them don't have seeds coming up, I'll just plunk another seed in there. So because these are all pickling cucumbers and I'm going to be using them all to make a variety of pickles, mostly bread and butter pickles, because that's our favorite, I'm not actually gonna even bother tagging these because most of these are going to be these market more cucumbers from um, high mowing seed. And they are pretty much the same um, as the homemade pickles. So I'm not gonna worry about it. Germination rates here. Yeah, this is between 75 and 85 for germination on these guys too. So it's not super high, 
but high enough I feel comfortable with just one seed per cell. Little sprinkle of soil on top. Really start feeling like the full-blown gardening season where I get to be out in my actual garden gardening is right around the corner when I start planting my pickling cucumbers and my squash. Four weeks is nothing. And now for a watering. I wanted to show you this new water sprayer that I got in just one second. That if I actually had to water more than just these, I would be pulling out right now because it's just fabulous. So I'm gonna mark these as pickling cucumbers. And pop them over here. Actually, I'm out of trays right now. So that gives us 48 pickling cucumbers. And I just don't feel like that's enough. <laughs> so I'm gonna do a few more. A couple of years ago, I made some row covers for my pickling cucumbers, just like little mini greenhouse hoop houses over top of them. And that worked extremely well for getting them going off to a really good, strong, robust start. And I am going to do that again this year. There are so many things that I just wanna to try to really improve upon in my gardening. It doesn't really seem to matter how long you've been gardening. I've been gardening for, I don't even know, geesh, over 20 years now anyway. And I'm still learning every single year and there's still something I screw up on every single year. Always, always areas to improve on everything it seems. Okay, we'll do some of MI Gardener's National, National Pickling Cucumber, because this one's a good one too. I've done this one a couple years in a row, but because these are older seeds, I will put two seeds per cell for these guys. I really do not like putting more than one seed in a cell, just because I hate pulling out um, seedlings and having to compost them. In some cases, you're able to separate them out and put them in uh, another container and have that plant be able to actually grow into a plant, but more often than not, it would just be way too many. So we end up having to compost them. Hmm. I'm really starting to um, run out of space in here. <laughs> Let me show you. All of our shelves are just about packed full. This greenhouse is around 10 by 14 or so, which is a really great size for, I think, most gardeners. If you're growing a lot of plants like me, I'll do a quick calculation to see how many I actually have in here just to give you a, some a point of reference. But I would have liked to have it maybe four more feet long. Uh, the width is actually just perfectly fine. There's lots of working space and I wouldn't want to have any more space wasted than this, but four more feet that way would kind of be ideal for me. Let me just do a quick calculation of where we're at for the number that we have. I have around 1300 or so plants in here, which kind of blows my mind a little bit seems wrong, but some of the trays have 50 little seedlings in each tray, so I guess that's right. I just counted my onions um, as like one plant per container, just because there's like 600 onions planted there, and there's only a couple of trays of them. But yeah, somewhere like that. So if you're gonna plant anything less than that, this size of greenhouse is perfect for seed starting. Before we had our high tunnel, we grew in this greenhouse. So these shelves weren't here and it was just garden beds all the way around. It was really cute actually. And we would just bring tables in to, or uh, two by fours and any kind of wood we could find really on sawhorses. And that's what I would use for my tables for starting my seeds. But as my garden grew and we got a high tunnel, we were able to convert this just into a seed starting greenhouse, which I feel very blessed to have. I am very much running out of space here though, that's for sure. Okay, so we have still a couple of the paper pots that I have filled down here with my squash that are empty and need 
some squash put into them. Do I have any of the zucchini started yet is the question. I have the Stardust zucchini started, but not our Black Beauty. So we'll do our Black Beauty. And then I think what we're going to do is head outside and I was gonna pull out all those garlic that I showed you the other day that were coming up from last year's garlic. And I want to split those out and get those into the ground before they get too much bigger. So I think we'll probably do that when we're done this. And then I have some, something to show you up at the house that I forgot to show you when we were up there. We had, when we went out to do morning chores today, we found a little chick, a tiny little chick that had just hatched out, wandering around by itself. Um, and its mom, I managed to figure out which chicken was its mom because she was clucking and freaking out. When I brought the chick over to her, she fully attacked it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she um, left the nest, ab had abandoned it, and there were still eggs in it. So we took those eggs up to the house and we did something called candling, which is to put a flashlight at the end of the egg to see if there was any movement. And there was about six of them that had a movement in them. So I brought out the incubator, put those eggs in the incubator. The chance of them surviving is not super great at this point, but we wanna give them a chance. They should hatch out within the next couple of days. As, um, when a chicken is going to set eggs, she'll lay her eggs over 12 to 14 days, usually 12 to 14 eggs, give or take and then she'll start sitting on them. And at the point of sitting on them is when they'll start to develop because they need the warmth to start developing. It's really cool and it's a way to make sure that all those eggs are hatching at the same time. So she'll sit on those eggs for 21 days and then usually within 48 hours, whatever eggs are going to hatch are will hatch. So the chance of these eggs hatching is not super high, but we wanted to give them a chance. So they're in the incubator right now. And then the little chick, we brought up to the house and one of the meat chicks that I have was not doing really well. It was about half the size of the other one. So I brought that one up to be a companion for the little chick and to see if I can't help that one get going a little bit as well. So just a sec, I just have to write down the name of these ones that I'm planting right now. So those ones are the Black Beauties. So now we're going to do the Costata Romanesco. These are just the most beautiful um, zucchinis. Look at that. They're variegated. I just think they're gorgeous. I love variegated anything. I actually have a beautiful variegated tomato over there. It's the first time I've ever grown a variegated tomato and I will show that to you. I'm actually going to plant a ridiculous amount of zucchini this year because last year I planted kind of my standard four, four or five zucchinis and I didn't have a great zucchini harvest and we love zucchini. So I'm gonna plant extra, but let me show you this gorgeous tomato. Can you see the variegation on those leaves? Isn't that beautiful? This one is Marina's Pride, and I got these seeds from Moonglow Farms in Alberta. They're just beautiful. Can't wait to see the tomatoes that it produces because the tomatoes have variegation on them as well. So that one was, uh-oh, was that one the Costa Romanesco? Oh, yes, it was, okay. Because I have this other one that looks very similar, and it's Cocazelle which is a very similar zucchini. Okay, last up, let's get our sugar bush, um, watermelon, our heart of gold cantaloupe. I'm very skeptical that I'm gonna get a cantaloupe, but I just wanna try for fun. I always try a few things just for fun each year. And then our kook melons, and I think I might plant another couple of the farthest north mixed mix um, melons. All right, my daughter just came running in here. She was very excited that I had planted her little kooka melons. So we're gonna put those over there. We had our membership meeting. So I have a membership community. I'm gonna be opening the doors again very soon here. So if you're interested in joining us, we would love to have you. But we were having a live call the other night actually from the greenhouse, which was awesome. And I was able to see some of their seedlings and hear about their garden plans. And it is so much fun to be in an environment where we all kind of have the same interests and we can talk excitedly about things like gardening and canning and all the, all the kind of old fashioned skills. It's so much fun. So if you would like to join us, 
we would love to have you. I will let you know as soon as the doors open again. And we're gonna be offering all kinds of uh, fun, free content for you too, just for everybody to be able to join in. And we're also going to be offering a Zoom call that is going to be a Q&A specifically about canning. And it's gonna come out in partnership with a free canning guide that I am working on diligently. I'm hoping to have it done within the next week that you will have access to, and then you can join in on the free call to get all of your canning questions answered. It's gonna be so much fun. So that's kind of part of our launch for our membership community and to give you a little bit of an inside peek into what the membership is like. So I'm really excited about that. So what am I planting here? Bush. Sugar baby. Oh, I hope those grow because man, a fresh watermelon is like nothing you have ever had before. They're so good. I managed to grow um, watermelon in my very first ever garden that I had back many, many moons ago, but we didn't live in this climate. We lived in a zone six. And so we had very hot days and nice warm summer evenings and I was able to grow watermelons and it was quite wonderful. Um, I guess I can just stick that one right here. Okay, so this is a 90 days to harvest and we have 110 frost-free days here. So that's kind of promising. So it's darn nighttime temperatures though, I tell you. That's what gets us. So I'll plant a couple in here, a couple of empty containers here. You know, it's been so darn hot uh, the last couple of summers, you never know. So I'll just throw these up in the crop garden, cover them up and see, or cover them with some row covers and see what we can get. Wouldn't that be so fun if we got cantaloupe? <laughs> My kids would love that. Did I tell you guys that I started some dahlias? So I have never grown dahlias before. Oh, apparently I've also started some weeds, but I had some dahlia tubers sent to me by West Coast Seeds. So I thought I would give them a try and see. So they are down in underneath the soil, I'm trying to give them a early start here. Hopefully we'll have dahlias. Wouldn't that be amazing? Oh, and also a random squash seed in there. I have absolutely zero experience with them, but according to the instructions on the package, I needed to bury them, um, cover them up with some soil, give them a water and then keep them relatively cool until they emerge from the soil. So I've been keeping them in here in underneath the tables because it stays relatively cool down there and I'll let you know how it goes. So now let's head outside and move those garlic. So I have some garlic that's coming up from last year that I missed plant or uh, picking. So I am just pulling them out of the ground and replanting them. And I did this last year and was able to get a harvest out of them. So for those that missed it last time, you can see that they're all in a bunch like this. And all we're gonna do is tease them apart and then plant the single ones in the ground. Let's see how many we can get. Do you know what's wonderful? Is my soil is so soft, like way down. Lovely. So happy with the way my soil is looking. So we tilled our garden last year and we've been doing a no-till garden for quite a few years. And mostly just because I was <laughs> maxed out and didn't have the capacity to deal with my garden. We tilled it. I took a Master Gardener program in the fall and I learned a lot about soil health and I made the decision again to go back to a no-till garden. And so what we did last year is we prepared all our beds and then we top dressed them manure compost uh, with probably eight inches of it. And then we covered up as many of the beds as we could with leaf mulch and grass clippings. Uh, we didn't have enough to cover the whole garden, but as much of it as we could, we did. And I am happy to say that my soil is just looking so beautiful and it's soft enough just to dig into with my hands. 
and it just looks lively and lovely. So that makes me really happy. Wow, that's quite a lot of garlic we got out of that. So now what I'm gonna do is just hang these roots down into the holes and pack them in. And I am going to mulch these again, just because we're still pretty dry, even with the rain that we got, and also um, cold. So I do wanna give these guys a little protection from that. So these garlic, I mentioned this last time, but these will not probably be quite as big as the garlic that I started, that I actually planted in the fall, that I ha I'm not digging up like this and starting them again, but I'll get decent enough harvests or harvest out of it. This is Russian red garlic, I believe. This is what I had in that row last year. So what my plan is with my garlic, because all of my garlic is coming up now, at least four or five inches above the soil is I'm gonna give it another couple of weeks and then I'll pull back the mulch and I will give it a little bit of fertilizer. And I've told you before that I use Gaia Green all purpose. So I'll fertilize these guys. And then depending on how they're looking, when I think they're probably gonna be just fine, just like that, uh, more, to, uh, more another top dressing of manure compost, but we'll see if they need it or not. Oh, the soil is just making me so happy. It's just beautiful. Depending on how they're looking, when I think they're probably gonna be just fine, just like that, I may end up um, giving them some uh, more, to, uh, more, another top dressing of manure compost, but we'll see. There is millions of microorganisms that and fungi and all kinds of things that live in the soil. And when you disrupt the soil, you kill tons of those. And that can actually have uh, initially a positive reaction to your garden because the breaking down of all of that life can give your plants a little bit of a boost, but it takes quite a long time to rebuild that soil again and to rebuild that web of life that's in your soil. So if you can not disturb your soil and instead feed it and feed all those microorganisms in your soil with things like compost, leaf mulch, grass clippings and all that kind of stuff. And my friends, healthy soil means more nutrient dense food because all of those nutrients that are in your soil will impact the growth of your plants and the vitamins in your plants and all that kind of stuff. So I am extremely excited, as you can probably tell, <laughs> about soil building. It is exciting to me. Look at those beauties. Even though it is cold and not overly pleasant outside right now, I have to say having my hands in the soil brings me so much joy. Not bad. So now let's head up to the house and I'll show you those little chicks before we sign off on today's video. So here's our little babies. So this is the meat bird that something is not right with. And then this is our little chick that we found this morning, isn't it? It's cute. It's so sweet. So they've been snuggled up together. There you go. What do you think? Can you go snuggle with your buddy? Look at that. <laughs> so cute. This is my daughter's little baby bunny. Isn't she so cute? Look at that. So sweet. All right, friends, that's going to be it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed spending some time with me and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.